Welcome to another episode of Light On, where together we take a journey to expand our consciousness. If this is your first time here, welcome. And oh, before you go, do subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon for good measure. If you're my returning viewer, thank you. I really appreciate your support. Our guest today is an internationally known spiritual teacher. He is committed to sharing practical wisdom teachings for happiness and awakening with people in a joyful and transformational way. He is one of my personal favorite teachers. I would really love you to help me welcome Nitya Shanti. So welcome Nitya. Glad to have you on the show. Good to be here. Thank you. Before we actually get into the show, Nitya, there is a question which I wanted to ask you. This is this. The normal trajectory of people is management school, corporate jobs, ladder, ladder, ladder. Uh -huh. You took a jump and you, you became a Buddhist monk. So could you explain <laughs> to me how this happened? I guess I just I just thought about what I really want and I I think if anybody asks themselves that question what do I really want it's of course you would, you may not get an immediate answer but if you stay with that question you know what do I really want who am I then you start dehypnotizing yourself and um, I remember when I entered MBA school before our first class there was a professor who came and said I'm doing a research study I've done it every year for the last so many years and I'm going to, before you even start your first class, you have to fill out this questionnaire. And the very last thing before you leave this MBA school two years from now, you have to again fill out the same questionnaire. And so it was, he was basically measuring values. And what he found was that uh, people's values change over two years of business school education, their values change. And they basically tend to become more materialistic and they tend to lose their idealism. <laughs> and, uh, but I asked him about my score after two years. And he said, no, your values remain the same. You're one of the few students whose values did not actually change. So I made a strong decision to not be influenced by uh, the culture. And to actually, I didn't, I, there's a nice saying that, you know, don't let yourself get educated. <laughs> it's really important. The whole world is trying to educate you. Uh, but the whole world also doesn't quite know what the best thing is always, right? So do they, are they really any smarter than you? So there's something about remaining innocent and not allowing oneself to get educated. So long story short, I think it is that willingness to question that made me go in the direction that I did. But if you if you were in management school, you would have been what, 21, 22 or younger, right? Yeah, 20. And 20 I was 22 by the time I graduated, I think. 21, yeah. 22, yeah. And um, I, I read in your uh, bio that you, you've been meditating since the age of 16. Would yeah. that have had something to do with, uh, with your decision? I'm very curious because why am I curious? A lot of youngsters, that is not their priority. You know, yeah. meditating, finding a spiritual path or actually even understanding what values are. Yeah. So what was it, what was different about you that you had this kind of an awakening? You know, I was also very normal. I was, uh, my aim was to be a fashion designer and I was... I had the usual thing that I was drawn to and I had my insecurities and everything. It just so happened that I went for a meditation course and something just clicked and I just got it. I just got what they're saying. Not that I fully internalized it, but I understood what they're trying to do here. I said, oh, there's no end to looking at the past, looking at the future. And we keep missing the moment where the power is. This is the moment where the power is. Uh, and there's no, we are trained in everything else. And education is supposed to be mind training, but it's mostly memorization and regurgitation. I mean, where is there any mind training? Uh, so the real most important aspect of education, which is not getting thrown away by, or not, not actually Aristotle defined education as the ability to have a thought and not believe it. That is almost not there at all in education. So in a way, we're just being, uh, you could say, conditioned. A lot of schooling is about conditioning. So I was lucky that I learned meditation and it, also that lucky that it clicked for me and I kept the practice going. The Buddha, used, there's a nice word in Pali language, dullabo. Dullabo means uh, very rare. And we may or may not believe this, but all the wise ones say that human life is rare. It is not easy 
Uh, and we think, oh, there's 7 billion of us. But, you know, a, a spoonful of dirt has more microorganisms than that. So human life is actually very rare. And then in human life, coming across teachings which make you question your own thinking, that's rare. And then to have faith in those teachings is rare. And then to practice those teachings is rare. It's increasingly rare. It's logarithmically rare. And then as you go along to be will devote your whole life to the full unraveling of your own conditioning, this is even more rare. And then the unraveling of that, the waking up to your true nature is rare. So I was fortunate in my life, many of those rare things lined up. And I don't think it's a matter of age, uh, whether you, you're 16 years old or you're 60 years old. Once you touch that inner source, uh, your intuition lights up. And when intuition lights up, you're not so easily fooled as you used to be. So I guess th those may have been some things which supported the process. I like the way you said it, how your intuition lights up. Yeah, that's a very beautiful <laughs> statement. When you were ordained as a Buddhist monk, what kind of a training did you have to go through? Well, uh, it's really, my teacher was very pragmatic and he did, actually did not emphasize meditation methods. It's fascinating that you would, you would imagine going to a monastery, the first thing they'll teach you the meditation method. But that was like very casual. Yeah, we'll deal with that. We'll take okay. care of that. Right now, when you're sweeping, just sweep. Okay. When you're cleaning the windows, just clean the windows. You know, when you're bowing, just bow. In other words, are you really there? When you're here, are you, when, you're, when you're chanting, are you chanting or is your mind gone somewhere else? So he kept said, keep, bring your mindfulness into whatever you're doing and make your whole day your meditation. And a part of me actually didn't like that because I was used to meditating. I'd gone for these intense meditation retreats. And if you go for, you know, 10 day, 20 day meditation retreats, you start accessing some very refined states of mind. And like anything that can also become your new thing. That's your new, uh, you can even call it an addiction actually. It's not such a bad addiction compared to the addictions in the world, but it's still an addiction. It is now you're craving, earlier you were craving outer experience. Now you're craving inner experience. And actually a part of me was quite restless. A part of me didn't, didn't really appreciate that as much. Now I appreciate it. But back in the day, I was like, you know, why we kept so busy all the time? <laughs> why can't we meditate more? <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was actually, it was, we wake up early in the morning. We would uh, have a morning chanting. There'd be meditation. Then we'd go for, get our food from the village. We'd take our bowls, walk to the neighboring village. And then we'd have our food. We only ate once a day. So 8.30 in the morning was our meal of the day. What you now call intermittent fasting. We were, we were doing it. And then we would clean up, clean the monastery, do our duties. And then we'd go back to our hut and then we'd have five, six hours by ourselves. You can read, you can study, you can meditate. And the evening we'd have some uh, refreshment, a uh, little tea or something, nothing, nothing like food. Um, and then we would have some evening chanting. And then some days there'd be a talk by a visiting teacher. It was really quite spacious. The day was actually pretty spacious, but of course, uh, for me, I wanted just to like a meditation retreat. Let's just go, let's just meditate all the time. And I couldn't see that what he was pointing to that life is meditation and not meditation is not a thing, right? You don't, you don't, you don't meditate to get good at meditation. You meditate to get good at life. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> what do you teach right now? Is it just Buddhism or, or is there a mix of various things that you've learned? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, getting unhooked you know how do we get we get hooked now whatever helps you get unhooked and so the buddha also asked his disciples he says you know there's a river there's this shore and there's the other shore and what i'm giving you is a raft so once you get to the other shore what will you do with the raft will you carry it on your head they said no we leave the raft it's done <laughs> so in other words when you go to the doctor you're given a strip of medicine you know have this twice a day and you have it diligently but when you're healed that strip of medicine just lies there. You don't go around carrying it around. You don't wear a badge. Okay, I had this medicine. So I think there's a little bit too much fascination with labels. And this is Buddhism. And this is this ism and that ism and this philosophy. And we forget, we get so caught up in that. And we make a new identity around that. So I'm actually not, of course, I have been trained in the Buddha's teachings. So definitely there's an influence of that. But I'm not hung up on that either. Because within Buddhism, of course, you'll find so many different points of view. Nowadays, if in India, someone says they're Buddhist, they normally mean they're doing chanting. That's normally what it means. Mm. And often these people don't even know the first part of what, if you, if you ask them a little bit deeper questions about Buddhism, what are the 10 paramitas, the six paramitas, what are the, uh, the, the, the noble truths? Uh, what's the first discourse the Buddha gave? They often get confused. And not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just one 
one expression of the Buddha's teachings interpreted by a teacher in Japan many centuries later. So within Buddhism, you'll find absolute diversity. You'll find, you'll find faith in Buddhism. Uh, you'll find uh, tantric practices in Buddhism. Uh, you'll find a uh, very uh, philosophical, deep philosophical analysis in Buddhism. You'll find very much based on leave all of that, just do good work kind of thing. So all the yoga, the karma yoga, the bhakti yoga, the gyan yoga, the raj yoga, all of that is there. Now it, it takes, we have, to, we have to mature a little bit so we can realize that ultimately all of these are like a thorn to pull out a thorn. By itself, it's nothing. And you have to be honest with yourself and check, is my suffering actually diminishing? Or have I taken on one more now uh, ideology? And have I now become one more, have I joined one more cult or group? So I guess what I'm trying to do is to keep as far as possible, to keep myself free from any isms and any, like the Buddha said, more sticky than your attachment to people and possessions is your attachment to views. Very, very fascinating. So, so at one level you can become a monk and I've seen this. Monks, such fine monks have given up everything. They're very pure hearted. Uh, they're very contented, but they still would fight over viewpoints. Because you see, oh, this, man, this monk is, is misrepresenting the Buddha. He's misrepresenting Dharma. And such big fights. And the most subtle ego is the attachment to views. So I guess my work is to help people get free from everything, including their views. <laughs> That's really nice. I know that you have, your, you facilitate workshops which are called uh, joy shops. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that word really fascinated me because I know that we are all moving towards finding happiness and finding joy. So what do you teach in your joy shops? You know, it's, I've, I've always taught what I feel I need to learn, which is why I've not kept it so tight in terms of a structure. And in, when I first began, I was, I was, there were three things I was emphasizing. I was emphasizing deep listening and deep love and deep silence. And to an extent that would still be a good foundation. Very broadly, it is training in attention and intention to reveal our foundation. Attention, intention, foundation. So you could say it's attention training. It's uh, becoming aware of, it is learning the art of focus and also what to focus on, what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what is skillful, what is unskillful, what is helpful, what is unhelpful. And then ultimately turning focus back to itself. What we're really looking for is that which is looking. So in a, in a, in a very broad sense, I'm teaching what I find to be supportive of self-realization and self-actualization, or you could call it enlightenment and empowerment. And it's uh, un my style is very unstructured, although there is an underlying intuitive structure, but it is, it is more responsive than prescriptive. It is responsive to, even, even in a virtual call, I'm sensing what's alive in me, what's alive in the group, what's alive in the space. And I, and I try to ride the horse of that aliveness. You know, I try to be in, in, in sync with that aliveness and wherever it takes me. And sometimes it takes us to deep meditations. Sometimes, sometimes it takes us to some book readings. Sometimes it's just to question answers. And yeah, I'm not, I, I try to hold the identity of being a teacher lightly. It is an identity after all. It's just another role that one plays, right? So hold it lightly, not tightly. And I think, yeah, I would just say my underlying assumption behind all of this is that all of us are wise. Everyone has, every, see, we are all avatars. Rama and Krishna were not the only avatars. Each one of us is an avatar. But our journey is to become a maha avatar. And maha avatar is to, to, to know that you're an avatar, to know that you're an anch of that. You are a part of the whole. And actually you are one with it. You're not separate from it, right? So that journey of realizing, owning our own wisdom. And one last thing I'd say is when I began teaching, I had the sense that I could approach teaching from the idea of I'm a Buddha and these are Buddhus. <laughs> I'm the wise one. And these people have come. They don't fully understand. Let me, let me help them. You know, second version is I'm the Buddha. They are the Buddhas. This itch to teach only a Buddha can have this kind of itch. How, who, who, the hell am I? Who do I know? What do I know? What is best for them? How, how can I be arrogant enough to assume, like they say in Zen, to teach is a mistake. To not teach is also a mistake. Now, which mistake are you going to commit? <laughs> so anyway, and the third one is, I, to, is that I'm a Buddha and they are a Buddha. We are all Buddhas. 
Buddhas are rejoicing in the company of Buddhas. And the fourth one is I just am and they just are. In other words, I fully embrace my full humanity and my full divinity. So I think playing with stories like this, it breaks the spell of I'm the, I am the great one I'm, and you are just going to learn from me and I have to give you some kind of transmission and also breaks the spell of, uh, yeah, all the spells start breaking, hold the stories lightly, use it, use all of these opportunities of the thorn to unhook yourself from the thorns. If there was one thing that you could teach the world, <laughs> again, now I'm going to give you the responsibility of bringing your wisdom <laughs> to the world. What is it that you would love to teach? You know, I don't have a set thing, but I'll tell you what came up today. I was meditating and a very interesting question came up. In what way am I a beggar? In what way am I a beggar? Now, I may not look like a beggar, but in some ways, my consciousness can still be like a beggar. I may be thirsty for knowledge. I may be thirsty to make an impact in the world. I may be thirsty for community. I may be thirsty for, you name it. And it may be more refined, whatever, but it's still ultimately the mindset of a beggar. I want, I need, I want some experience to fulfill me. And I've already had so many cool experiences. Maybe you know, a lot of the things that most people want, I've experienced, I've traveled around the world. You know, uh, I have a fancy car, uh, you know, I do, I've, I've dated some very beautiful women, you know, and so I've experienced a lot of really cool things and that hasn't completely fulfilled me. So now it's the next thing. So now it's the next thing. So I think it's a very powerful question. And, you know, I have taught in some of the most like affluent places in the world. I was teaching in Beverly Hills and, and I noticed even there, I asked, you know, so what do you want more of? Money. <laughs> So you can be living in million dollar mansions and still you want more money and still you want more recognition and still you want something. And so this is, this is a very powerful question to ask ourselves in what way am I, am I a beggar? And not that being a beggar is bad. Being a beggar just is being a beggar. It's okay. It's not that you're the bad thing. Beggars also are doing the dharma. But notice in what ways are you being a beggar? And the way, in, in those ways, you've been hypnotized. You've been hypnotized. Either some kind of outer unfulfillment or some kind of inner and in unfulfillment, outer poverty or inner poverty? And is it really true? Who am I without that thought? In fact, sometimes I get uh, I, like very powerful te teachings in my dream. So just when I woke up this morning, there was, a, there was a teaching in the dream. The question was, in what way is this moment incomplete? In what way is this moment incomplete? And then the second question is, who would you be? Because ultimately, this is actually heaven, except for a thought. A thought makes it incomplete. Could you compare it to how it could have been, should have been, would have been? Otherwise, how do you know it's incomplete? If you were just born this moment, how would you know anything is incomplete? Some comparison is happening. Some judgment is happening. So then the second question is, who am I without that belief, that story, that comparison, that thought? And in a way, this is the, fir this is the first two and the last two noble truths of the Buddha. The Buddha says, there is suffering, there's the cause of suffering. And there's an ending of suffering and there's a way to end suffering. And, I, and that gets collapsed with these two questions. The first question is, in what way is this moment imperfect? And that's the thorn of suffering. And notice the Buddha never said life is suffering. Sometimes people say Buddhism is a pessimistic religion. No, he never says life is suffering. He says there is suffering. Dukkha hai. Right? So notice in what way is this moment feeling not quite there yet. I need to become more something else. They have to become something else. I need to achieve this, need to achieve that. That is your beggar mindset. So notice that it's a thought. And now just step back. Who am I without this thought? And welcome back to heaven. <laughs> uh, this question is something that I use very frequently. Who am I without this, without this belief? And I found, find it very empowering. The thing is, when you, when you, sometimes when you ask yourself that question, who am I without this thought, you really don't know. And you don't know whether you want to let go of that thought because we are very attached to our, our suffering. I know there are clients who come to me and who say, if I don't have all this drama in my life, life would be so boring. How do you answer questions like that? Yeah, and who are you without the story of boredom? You know? Yeah. Boredom, boredom, you know, boredom is not as bad. Fear is not as bad. None of these things are as bad. In fact, there was a TED talk I watched where the lady said, I forget what eight, but she said, there are only eight major emotions that you're trying to get away from all the time. 
And all of those eights, if you can just stay with them for 90 seconds, they will dissipate. That is the barrier between us and freedom, 90 seconds of unwillingness to stay. So what's the big deal? So get bored. So what's the big deal? So feel empty. So what's the big deal? So feel abandoned and feel it, really go through it. What happens is we feel it for two seconds and then we get into a story. We get into a spin. Oh, this means I am, you are, or better eat something, better drink something, better buy something, right? Better distract myself. And this is another word that Eckhart Tolle calls it. The term he uses is pain body. We have this pain body, individual pain body, collective pain body. And women have it and men have it. And every religion has it. Every religion has its own shadow. Every family has its own shadow. Every culture, every country has its own shadow. Like if you're sensitive and you meet people, like I know Indians have their own very distinct pain body. Americans have their distinct pain body. I've lived in, a, you know, I was meditating in my, my monastery was an international monastery. So it was fascinating. You could see all each of these people, like Americans are very individualistic. But in being so individualistic and trying to shine and be separate, they're all the same, but everyone's trying to be individualistic. <laughs> so you realize they have their own very unique, specific suffering. Chinese have their own specific suffering. Japanese have their own. And the Japanese have a lot of cool stuff as well. Their culture is very amazing in some ways, but in some ways it's very sticky. And so it's very toxic, right? So you start stepping back. The whole process is metacognition. Step back from your personality. Step back from your thinking process. You start seeing it more clearly. You start seeing these distortions more clearly. And to the extent you can see it more clearly, you're not so easily fooled by it. And to that extent, you can support others and not being so easily fooled by it. So you're waking up to who you really are. Really true. So I have a question for you, which is, this is a question which is asked by every single person in this world. How do you find your purpose in life? <laughs> yeah, how come no bird has ever asked this, no cloud has ever asked this, no tree has ever asked this? How come when you're in the middle of a football match, you never ask this. How come when you're in the middle of making, making love to someone, you never ask this, right? In other words, who would you be without? Is it really as important a question as we imagine it is? I mean, right now, my purpose is to answer your question. And after a while, it'll be something else. It'll be to brush my teeth or to have some breakfast or to meet some friend or to, you know, whatever. It's, 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 the purpose will be, it's responsive, whatever is happening. What if, what if I define what's happening as my purpose? In fact, this question came up to me uh, many years back, the idea of what's my purpose. And I said, let's assume there is such a thing called purpose. And let's assume it can either be fulfilled or less than fulfilled or even more than fulfilled because there are these teachings called NDE, near-death experience, where they, they pass on and they have a past life review. And then they're told whether you did well or you, you fulfilled your purpose or you didn't fulfill your purpose or you more than fulfilled your purpose. So I said, if it's possible to more than fulfill, I would like to fulfill my purpose a million fold. Now, that's a very interesting question. What is your purpose? Can you fulfill it? And not just fulfill it, can you fulfill it a million fold? Now, the only way you can do that, to my understanding, is if you define purpose as doing what I'm doing. So right now, answering your question, I have fulfilled my life purpose. Walking from here to the kitchen, I have fulfilled my life purpose. Combing my hair, I have fulfilled. When I'm combing my hair, the purpose of my life, I waited my whole life to comb my hair. It's not a small thing. Combing my hair is a very complex job. Ask someone with Parkinson's disease, right? It's, it's not as easy as it looks. So it's the purpose of my life to comb my hair. It's the purpose of my life to feed my kids, my friends, to play a game, whatever it is I'm doing, that's the purpose. So I like to say the purpose of life is to be alive. Do what makes you come alive and be alive in whatever you're doing. This could be one possible answer. That's pretty deep because when you're saying that the purpose of my life is, let's say, to comb my hair, what we are actually saying is to be where we started from, which is to be mindful and be in the moment. Okay. Now, because I'm full of questions, I'm going to ask yeah, yeah, another don't. question. The there was something that you said right in the beginning, which you said that when you when you take these workshops, one of the things that you ask is what is alive in me and what is alive in the in the participants. For most of us, it's very difficult to figure out what is alive in us. So, is there any way to to actually find out find that out? Yeah, very very basically, uh, the sense of 
what is expanding me and what is contracting me right so suppose i say okay let's you know uh, sheila this is a great discussion and let's go deeper into this discussion let's talk about this let's talk about that and you check is it expanding or contracting so, you know sheila enough of this let's talk about the movies you've been watching Let, let's talk about which magazine you've read and uh, yeah that's not really your <laughs> and that's contracting you so you sense what expands you what contracts you and what makes the journey appear more light and more heavy and what makes the 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 way ahead seem bright or dark you just ask these simple questions and this you start getting a sense of your resonance what's expanding what's contracting you know one really powerful question is do i even know what i really want i mean how many of us can really say because how much of it is conditioned you know like i notice in the work that i do it is it is people expect me or oh, you should be writing books okay you should be on youtube okay you should be on instagram okay you should be in this this you should be giving ted talks and why who 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 says i mean just because this is what people tend to do right and yeah i have done that i've given a ted talk and i've you know done some of those things but is that really my desire how much it's actually a very powerful question do i really want what i want or is it just conditioning are we just going along or oh, this is what everyone does <laughs> if you are if you are a girl this is what you do if you are a man this is what you do if you are from this culture this is what you do and you may still do it but at least no at least do it with eyes wide open right so i think this is it's it's a, it's a very powerful question you know is what makes me come alive and uh, is it really the, the, i was reading yesterday two kinds of motivation autonomous what motivation and control motivation autonomous motivation was genuinely coming from your innermost being you could call it your ikigai you know, really deep down this is what you love this is what you this is what you're good at this is what benefits the world and uh, the other one is control motivation is because you're expected to like the duty <laughs> i'm expected to yeah. and this is what my parents want this is what everybody wants right and so you cannot be happy in this world if you only operate from control motivation yeah once in a while you may do it and you may choose to do it but you cannot be happy in this world unless you get in touch with your autonomous motivation so i think more than my answering the question what's your purpose and you, this is a question that has to burn you down it has to burn the edifice of what you're believing about yourself and your world and who you are in this world these kind of questions are designed to burn all that down like one powerful question comes from stephen covey where he says write your own obituary if you were to write your own obituary what would people say what would family members say what would friends say what would colleagues say what would people who just barely met you say what would the newspaper say this really makes you thinking you start thinking so do you do you how many of us want in our obituary the read out this one earned so much per month <laughs> and this one lived in this part of town and this is what his business card said this is what his resume said yes. really is that what you want to be read in your obituary so it's a very powerful question so these questions are really designed not for somebody else to answer for you but for you to answer for yourself there is another powerful question which i which i read in this book by edra ford but her question is very very interesting and she says suppose you were to read a newspaper article about yourself tomorrow and it's full of lies what is the few words which would which would really offend you because there are certain words which people call you it doesn't offend you but certain was really offend you which again i find a very wow. powerful question to ask what a great question yeah because that is to uncover your shadow sides and to see what are those things that you are really holding on to you know this happened to ramana maharishi somebody came and wrote a really really bad article really uh, what do you say critical critical article about ramana maharishi and really defaming him and you know all yeah. kinds of slander lies all kinds of stuff and uh, everyone was trying to hide the paper from ramana maharishi but of course he found out so he found the paper he cut out that article and he put it on the main notice board the maharishi what are you doing why are you putting up this horrible article i think whenever any other article comes you put it up on the notice board why are you not putting this one up then <laughs> <laughs> how beautiful he said you know even that is do you think that's true that's also a projection Absolutely. this is also a projection so that shows the the quality of the liberation that he was able to take a an a stinky article about him full of all kinds of lies and and maliciousness and he put that up on the main notice board and said this also deserves to be here no one's taking it down if you're going to put up those articles then otherwise don't put up any articles <laughs> so what a great question yeah is there any process that you would you can share with our viewers with you yeah i sometimes wonder you know how many more processes people need do they really practice the processes they already know <laughs> no they don't but it's it's really nice to give them one more because at the end of the day 
uh, I like to tell my students that the thing is, it's like a tool. You keep it in your toolbox whenever you need it. Use it. Yeah. Right? So, so let them use it. You give them the choice. Um, I would say, uh, how about this? That you, because I do this. I, uh, I have what I call a second brain. And by second brain, it could be it could be on the internet, it could be on the computer, it could be on your notepad. But you start compiling the best lessons you've ever learned. And it could be practices you know, it could be things that your parents taught you. Like I know we have a family friend who every year he circulates a document. It's typically typically about 20 pages long. And it is a distillation of his life's best lessons. And he edits it. Every year he edits it, he takes out a few things, rewrites a few things, adds a few things. He says, more important than the my will and the money I'm leaving behind and the property I'm leaving behind. This document is my real will. This is the best life lessons I've learned in, le in, in business, in relationships, as a human being. These are my life's best lessons. How fascinating, right? So that's a good practice for us. I think more than learning from me or even learning from you, let people learn from themselves and let them start valuing their own wisdom. Like I used to forever feel at some level inferior to my teachers and to the Buddha and to all of these great saints, you know, that, oh, they have such a great realization. But that, that way of thinking is just not, I just haven't realized my own realization. And we have to learn to bow down to our own realization. So start compiling the best things that you have learned, the best uh, insights you've had, the things that took you through your hard time, the practices, the teaching, and yes, why not? The authors that have influenced you, uh, the question, like today we've shared a lot of interesting, powerful questions. So I, sh I, I make a compilation of all of this and I, I, I revisit that. And every time I revisit that, it, it reinvigorates me, re-inspires me. So ultimately that's what's really gonna, you know, it's actually reminding people what they already know. I often tell people in my sessions, you may have no takeaways from the session and that will be a blessing. Because how many more takeaways you want? Don't we have a, a cart full of takeaways? And the whole thing has become, okay, in fact, it's a, it's a trend nowadays. An author writes a book. He puts his life's best lesson in the book. And somebody then makes a summary of that book. Okay, this is a summary of that book. <laughs> and then somebody says, you know, forget about summary. Here are the two minute synopsis of that book. So now you got the two minute synopsis and you forgot it two minutes later. If I was to ask you what was there, the, you did not remember anything. It was just a bit of a high that you got for a short while. So we're trying to compress and compress and compress, but you have to go through the experience. So trust the experiences you've already had, read the book of your own life, reflect on what you already know. And if I was to give you the challenge of compiling your best life lessons for your children, for your family, for your friends, what would you leave behind? Isn't that a better, uh, a better legacy to leave behind than just, uh, you know, whatever, a social media page full of random meals that you had? Okay, it's good to have nice meals. That's all you have, photographs of food you've had and fancy clothes you've had and fancy holidays you've been on. I mean, so what? What's the big deal? That might be an interesting practice. It's really an interesting practice. Actually, so uh, I'm going to urge the viewers to actually write their book of life and their lesson and leave it in the comment box. I think it will be an interesting thing to read. If you give me a chance to uh, share, I'll show you just what my mind looks like. I have a, this is my second brain where I keep, so if you see this, <clears throat> Okay. So like this is this is a, just like a this is like a brain dump kind of list, all tools and concepts, right? So I just made a list of all my and in no particular order, important thing that I've learned in my life, yeah. right? So this is just like a, a general list, and this goes to over five hundred things, yeah. right? And I can just stop anywhere. Like for example, dark retreats. I had once gone to, I had gone for a six day or so, I think it was eight days. Eight days of living in complete darkness, right? Yeah. And there were many, complete yeah. Complete darkness. Living, complete darkness, not a single ray of light, you know, okay. and there were a lot of important lessons I got from that, right? Mm. For example, saying how wonderful, 317, saying how wonderful, no matter what happens, say how wonderful. When strong serve, when weak surrender. Mm. So like this, I just, I just compile this, I'm not even thinking about, just go ahead and make a list of all the things, good things you've learned in your life. Yeah. The last thing I'm reading these days is something called Reality Transurfing, a very interesting book I'm enjoying. So this is something, so like that's an example. Then you can talk about mindfulness, you know, favorite tools for mindfulness, concentration, self-inquiry. And like some of these things will open up to become more, like you can double click on them. Okay. So like that. And then to do with intuition, healing, integration, trauma release. And like this, I've made a list of, you know, all kinds of things. 
So you, you can see on the left, you know, all my favorite important life experiences, um, digital tools that I like, my favorite board games, productivity tools, my favorite exercises like this. And you can, you can make your own, your own kind of way of, of tabulating this. Yeah. What's that yet to be sorted? I saw one. That's yet to be sorted would be just like, a, I guess a dump, a dump of all yeah. kinds of stuff. <laughs> Is that the picture there? Okay. <laughs> I don't even see the yet to be sorted one. It must be somewhere on the left. You see yet yet yeah. yet to be sorted. Yeah, yeah, on the left, right there. Ah, yet to be sorted. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this. Oh, this is this is just some notes from my different notebooks I've taken. Okay. And I have to yet to go through this. Oh, this is yeah. a really good idea because I have notes in all kinds of places. Yeah, I just photograph them. I just put them over here, right, like that. Yeah. So yeah, this is a list of thing important things I've learned in my life. So just going back over this. Mm -hmm. These are, my, these are my, the teachers I consider to be very clear thinkers. Mm -hmm. I challenge myself to make a list of beings whose thinking I admire and who have influenced my way of looking at the world in some significant mm -hmm. way. So here you have a list of maybe more than 100 people who I find mm -hmm. their thinking is very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is, this, is, this is what I like to share with people. Trust your own journey and learn from yourself. Mm. Nice. So, thank you very much, Nitya. Lovely. Is there any last thought that you would like to leave our viewers with? Oh. Um, I would like to leave them with the thought of, like, it's actually similar to the question that you asked about if you read the newspaper and people say all of these things about you, what things will hurt the most? Mm. And what this is actually revealing is what you're giving a lot of importance to. So are you giving importance to having a good reputation? Are you giving importance to being knowledgeable? Are you being, giving importance to being pure hearted? Are you giving importance to touching a lot of lives? Are you being, giving importance to being sincere? Well, now this is your, what you give importance to is the hook, right? This is how your, this is how your personality is, is standing on these foundations of what you're giving importance. This is how you define yourself. Yeah. So who are you without giving that importance? Suppose that importance is taken away. In fact, the word impo important or importance comes to important and important can that hey, inside important is import. Yeah. You're trying to import something, right? So if you think serving the world is important, right? Then you're doing that to import a certain experience into your life. In other words, you're feeling like, feeling like a beggar, basically. You're a beggar, the, because you're a beggar, a country imports typically what it doesn't have enough of, right? So if you don't have a certain mineral, you'll import it from another country. If you don't have enough iron ore, you'll, you'll import that. So whatever you're feeling you're lacking in, those are things you start giving importance to outside. So if you feel you're not knowledgeable enough, then you start giving importance to knowledge, mm -hmm. right? So who are you? First of all, recognize what are you giving importance to? Notice how that is the new distortion. <laughs> See, it's taking you away from your center. In yeah. Kashmir Shaivism, this is called one of the limitations. To assume I have some knowledge and I don't have some knowledge. To assume I have some skills and I don't have some skills. To assume I'm in some locations and not in other locations. To assume I'm in some time and not in all time. To assume I'm some individual and I'm not some other individual. I am someone and not somebody else. All of these are limitations that are put on our infinite reality of who we really are. You know, this, as, as a person, I may be limited, but life is limitless. Right, as I'm breathing in, I'm breathing in life. I'm breathing in all the trees of the world. I'm breathing in all the oceans of the world. I'm breathing in all the stars of the world. I'm thoroughly intertwined with everything. But then my idea of me, that's limited. My idea of me is limited, but who I really am is unlimited. So in a way, what you are doing and I'm doing in our own ways, we are trying to wake up, wake up from the distortion, wake up from the dream of separation again and again and again. I want to end with what Alan Watts talks about. He gives a very nice thought experiment. He says, suppose you had the capacity in a single night to dream 75 years of time. So in one night, okay. you could have a full lifetime, most people's lifetime, like 75 years. You could dream 75 years. So what would you do? So most likely in the beginning, you would fulfill all your desires. You would have the most beautiful, handsome partners. You would live in the most beautiful mansions. 
uh, you would have the most amazing fun time and you know, not tasty food. But after several nights of doing this, okay, now you've had the women, you've had the food, you've had, now let's have some adventure. <laughs> so now you'll, all these challenges to overcome and you'll fight dragons and you'll rescue princesses and you'll fight these wars. So you'll go through that phase. Now, when you've even done that, now the next thing, now even this has become like stale because every night you're dreaming up 75 years. So then you'll say, let's go one step deeper. Let's forget that we are dreaming. Wow, now what happened? Now I've forgotten that I'm dreaming. So now it all feels very real. Yeah. Right. So now everything now it really affects me because it's like this is real. This is real, right? And then you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the matrix because you know that you know what's going to happen at the end. You're going to wake up. Like we like movies that entrance us. We don't like movies that say, "Yeah, I can see he's acting. Mm -hmm. I know this person. I mean, this is. I'm not even getting en engaged by this movie because we want to be transported. We go to the movie because we want to be transported. So we go deeper and deeper into the dream because we want to forget. The universe actually wants to forget. Shiva wants to forget. And so we come to a point where we realize that what if I dream the dream that God is dreaming? In other words, right now, God has dreamt up this dream of me being in Pune, sitting in front of my laptop and talking to you. And suppose I choose that dream. Like of all the million possibilities, this is what God has chosen. So I also choose this. So for the first time in my life, my dream equals God's dream. This is freedom. It's so powerful. Combing the hair is no less important than giving an inspiring talk to a million people. That is that because that my dream. God wants to comb hair, and I want to comb my hair. And so you see, and my hair already unbadly uncombed. I'm talking about combing my hair again. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like I need to comb my hair. So, but the point is that you choose what life is choosing. So, of all the infinite possibilities of dreams you could be having, you choose this dream. And so, in a sense, you are awake within the dream. And the like Maharaj said, you cannot wake up from the dream because that would be another dream. You, you can only wake up to the dream. So it's fascinating to be awake within the dream. And Kashmir Shaivism says, it's, it's fascinating because our, our conditioning in Indian tradition is that everything is Maya. Everything is illusion. Everything is illusion. Mm -hmm. So no matter what we do deep inside of it, this is Maya, but this is illusion. And we're not able to be, not able to be comfortable because you know, oh, it could just disappear, right? It will disappear. But Kashmir Shaivism says, no, it's all Shiva. It's all the ultimate. It's all God. In other words, right now, God's talking to God. There's no, there is no illusion here. Illusion, the word illusion is an illusion. Life just is, right? So nothing's missing. So coming back to those two questions, you know, what is, what is, what is missing? What is, what is imperfect? What is incomplete? And who am I without that thought? And you're right back in heaven. You're right back in your full power, full grace. <laughs> so that was a fascinating, enlightening conversation with Nitya Shanti. Let's use one of the tools that he's given us or one of the challenges that he's thrown us. Let's start creating our book of life, putting down all the things that we learned, all the processes that we know and all the wisdom that we've gained, which we can then leave behind as a legacy for the people in our life. If you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up and share it with people who may need to hear this. Let's spread the light, folks. Thank you.